Hi, I'm Andrew Tsao. In this online episode of Backstory, we're going to preview Sweet Crude, a powerful documentary about the effects of oil production on the people and environment of the Niger Delta. Filmmaker Sandy Siafi and her crew made multiple trips to Nigeria, getting to know the people whose lives have been devastated by the indifference of multinational oil corporations and the repression of their own government. Thank you for being here, Sandy. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. So let's start sort of by looking at the nature of news programming itself. Here we are on a show that is designed to uh, promote and talk a bit about the art and act of filmmaking itself. But as the host of a show like this, I can only be guided by my own conscience in the sense of what moved me the most about your film. I'm most interested to learn first, what did you learn about the relationship of corporate news media versus independent documentary filmmaking versus the truth and that relationship which is so fraught and so complex that uh, is such a part of Sweet Crude and has a lot of bearing on why we're here today. Well, at, at the risk of sounding cliche, it was literally life-changing. I mean, it, it was hardly the case that I, I wasn't suspicious that mainstream media has had a negative effect on our capacity as a culture to deal with complicated issues, with the things that matter most. We don't go to the story, we often go to the scratch and sniff mm -hmm. image that is mostly about igniting response more than understanding. I knew that, mm -hmm. but what I think I didn't know was just how total and complete mm -hmm. um, the deal is at this point, which is to say that journalists who are working for mainstream media outlets, to give them a break for a moment, they're never given enough time to even spend time in a place. So right. if we can talk about the parts that are actually benign in right. what's wrong with what they're doing, right. that part's not their fault. They're sent in to do drive-by journalism. Mm -hmm. So they have one day in a place that I'm spending months, and then months over the course of several years. Um, that's part of the beauty of the long-form documentary. That's part of our job. Mm -hmm. Part of our job is to ask you to sit back for a much longer time and allow human complexity to yes. be something that's moving to you. Um, it's different if you're doing a three-minute piece for World News Now. Now that said, the part that's not benign yeah. is that the directive that's clear is to find the absolutely most incendiary part of a story and have that be the story. And in, in that way, it's actually causing harm. Right. It's not only potentially misreporting something, it's creating actual blood on the ground in places all over the world. And that is a level of... Um, I guess, of how, how far we've gone into the depths of hell with yeah. our storytelling that I wasn't aware of. It's almost as if the story at some point becomes completely divorced from the human beings mm -hmm. and becomes about sensationalism for its own sake. Yes. And we all know why. I mean, uh, advertising, ratings, and, and, and as you say, the lack of time, really, to uh, get to know a subject. You know, I mean, it's, it's perverse, really. It's gotten that far. Yeah, and, and that just says so much about the way all of us are going to end up viewing things because, really, it's the filter, it's the lens through which we see the world, uh, for the most part. You talked early in the film, you said a very powerful thing at the top, and it was that the film you're about to see is not the film I set out to make. Um, tell me this. News organizations that go looking for a story have their purpose, but it seems like they've already decided on a point of view that they're leaning towards in order to make it palpable, sellable, whatever that may be. Um, this is essentially a human story. Why do you think that the human element is not something that the mainstream media is interested in anymore. What, what, what are the factors? And since you live there on the ground and got to know these people, you must have along the way discovered some sort of common thread that's going on globally with our news media that uh, maybe you can share with us some of those sure. insights. And, and I'm going to extend that. I think there's a danger, a new danger, that is very current to this moment. We're all very excited about citizen journalists and the explosion of new media's capacity to change the metrics in terms of who's telling our stories. Yeah. And I too can be excited about that, but let's not get excited for excited sake, because sadly, a lot of what's going on is simply an imitation 
of what's been happening in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a crowd, if you, are, if you go to a protest with a camera, what you see are people's cameras being drawn to the exact same kinds of images that you were seeing on ABC. Right. And you're not seeing the people who say, wait a minute, if I just go sit with a family today that is not at the protest because they have a complicated set of reasons that they're not here. Right. If I push myself to be surprised, uncomfortable, to um, go outside of what I studied before I got here, to get my head completely turned around, right. if that's my job, that's a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. The problem is the people who are doing that, when yeah. they come home, they can't find either a distributor to sell their work, they can't find funding for their work, even when you write grants, even to the best human rights, uh, I will actually say that, you know, we had a problem where human rights organizations weren't showing our film because it doesn't fit the expectation of what are the current metrics on the ground. So if you show that you, for example, in our film, yeah. I actually listen to MEND, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta, right. and I get really turned around about my initial assumptions. Right. And in doing that, some of the assumptions that several international human rights organizations have about good and evil, right and wrong, they're not going to fit that story. So it's not just, uh, let's, let's not just indict mainstream media right. here. We're all in trouble. And right. as far as I'm concerned, we're there for multiple reasons. But I think underneath all of them is the same thing. If we really do get it, the level of discomfort we have to feel yes. about how we've organized our lives the drivers of that economy, et cetera. We would have to change everything about how we live. Now, you yourself, and we will see this when we look at the film, faced an ethical and personal, uh, a, a series of ethical and personal moments that caused you to question your role as a filmmaker, as someone who was witnessing history unfold. Sandy, in terms of the relationship of the idea of long form documentary, news, the human stories, is there such a thing as the objective truth? Or are we, are we always going to, depending on who we are and how we approach these things, going to be filtering what we see through the lens of our own experience or in fact through our conditioning as you just pointed out? Um, first of all, I, just to be very clear, no, there's no such thing as an objective truth. However, there are facts. Okay. And um, what happens often that's really dangerous is that someone who says, no, there's no objective truth, they might say that because they're using that as an excuse mm -hmm. for a level of um, subjectivity that's meant to be influential toward an outcome. So there's a difference, a really important difference, mm -hmm. in giving your audience a fair fight. Yeah. And that's part of my commitment. If I constantly let you know, my prism got shifted and this is how and who did it, and this is my vested interest, and this is what the way in which I'm not for sale. Mm -hmm. If you know all those things, then you have a shot at putting together the level of facts and then your own opinion. So what I try to do in the film is give actual facts their own treatment, as it were, yeah. both visually and, and otherwise, and then facts that are coming from NPR or ABC are shown within a frame that actually lets you know this is what they said. I'm quoting it, as yes. it were. Yes, yes, yes. And, and then my narration is written in such a way as to let you know over the course of the film, clearly I'm not pretending right. to be uh, writing this story like Lydia Polgren, the New York Times reporter, who is quite good, by the way. Mm -hmm. I'm not pretending to do Lydia Polgren's job. I have a different job. And I'm actually asking you to come with me into, I hope, a, um, a poetic place that moves you because if you're what you start realizing when you work on a film like this is statistics start to mean nothing mm -hmm. if I tell you that two million people died in the Biafran war does that move you off your couch mm -hmm. and I'm not just saying you me too right what numbers enough right what number of life expectancy drop because of oil would get me to do something different in my own life mm -hmm. and you start realizing those facts aren't the ones that are moving which ones are right. the number of weapons that are in the Niger Delta now how urgent the situation is I start realizing to really change anyone's heart or mind, mm -hmm. it's individual people and stories, and it's an overall respect for the, the poetry of the place. And, and in that regard, it brings us back to the idea of why long-form documentary at its core requires being on the ground in the place for an extended period of time. As a matter of fact, you made repeated trips back there in order to find this essence of, of what the story is. There's no substitute for it. Um, now let's take a look at the trailer for Sweet Crude.
identified the coming of oil. We had good fishes, rich estuaries, good coastal land, good harvest, unpolluted that our parents and our grandparents had. They were just living and they were getting by. And then this thing called oil came. Even a kid in the village will know that he is starving because of the oil companies. No medical attention, no food commodities, no housing, no road, no electricity. There is absolutely nothing. It's 100% zero. We have about 369 oil villages in a year in the Niger Delta. That is one every day. We don't know what we are going to leave for our children because the oil company wants to stay here and operate. They, 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 they don't care about the human beings who are here. All they care about is the money they make. Let them leave our land. We are not begging, it's not a privilege. It's our right to control our resources. We are going to demand our rights peacefully, non violently, and we shall win. If we sit back, it's our children, it's our community, it's our people that will be destroyed. So we say, no, 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 we got to make some corrections. Resource control and self-determination. What we stood for was democratic, was real, was our right, was our life. They will tear us, they will shoot us, they will beat us, nothing they don't used to do us. They can no longer kill our prophets. I will remain silent. Nobody is listening. I think you need to put in some strong measures. Yeah. If they want to stop it, they know how to stop it. They don't want to stop it. The authorities never respect dialogue. They respect the God. So that was how it came about, this uh, resistance. We need to match this firepower with firepower. To checkmate the firepower of the government. Because the truth must be said. <laughs> So we're looking like we're looking like a time bomb. A time bomb. And when it blows, it's gonna blow us all away. Everybody will be involved. Sandy. Let's talk a little bit now that we've seen the film about the making of it. Sean Porter, your cinematographer, a University of Washington graduate. Uh, let me say this. The film itself is shot in a way where the people and in a way, more importantly, the environment in which they live becomes a character in the film, which seems to me an essential part of the way the story is told. Can you talk a little bit about that thinking, that approach you both had in realizing Sweet Crude? Yeah, Sean Porter is a real thinking person's director of photography. Um, he's extremely talented for many reasons, and they're not just technical. Mm. It's because you can sit down with someone like Sean and say, say what I want is for the environment to be a character. And I want for the colors of gray in the sky to be 35 to 40 versions of it because it's filled with toxic waste that's going to dump on people's head. And I want to feel that that's ominous. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm asking him to do that in a place where there's no electricity, no running water, where we have a very low budget, mm -hmm, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're shooting on pretty basic cameras. Mm -hmm. And yet, Sean managed to not only do that himself as, as one of the main shooters, but he also directed two other cameras. And he pulled that off um, under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. So I want to say it's not only an act of all kinds of, of bravery on his part yeah. to have worked on this film, but it's also an achievement in terms of what he did to collaborate with me. And it's easy enough for me to say what I want yeah. and sound smart. But to have someone do it is another conversation altogether. So when you were in the various locations, he was actually running three cameras with his crew in order to get all the coverage you needed a a as it happened? So at any point in time, yeah. either Sean or Cliff Worsham or myself 
Um, and then earlier in the film, another woman named Pamela Dore shot okay. some of the film. But he's directing that look with everyone. He's saying, this is the kind of filtration you're using. Got it. These are the settings you're using. This is the kind of framing we want. This is a choice I made to use a monopod. This is the kind of lens I'm using. So he's making that decision. At any moment in time, we had, imagine a situation there where you get, mm, 20 minutes notice of a huge interview. Right. But you already had something else planned. So we're making decisions about which crew's going where. I got it. And he's handling all of that, sometimes by radio, sometimes by satellite phone. Mm -hmm. um, pretty extraordinary circumstances, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, while we're making this show right now, um, there are world events unfolding on the news daily. So let's go back to that for a minute because you know I watch the news coverage of what's happening in the Middle East and in North Africa I'm very aware now having looked at sweet crude of the relationship and the strange split between reality on the ground and the reality that's presented to us in the news um, how how is it that you as a crew and as a filmmaker, when you began to engage the people there, gained their trust, were able to stay for such a long time, and tell us a little bit about the reaction of not just the people you were filming, but the institutions you're, you're dealing with there. I mean, it's very interesting. One of the things I note about the film is the silence of the oil companies. Um, can you talk to us a little sure. bit about that? I'll, I'll start at the end. I actually did a ton of work to get Chevron to be more involved in the film okay. because I intended to be as balanced as possible. Back to your earlier question before we watched the film, yeah. I, I knew that I certainly had a predisposition toward being critical of the oil companies, but that said, I had also met with you know, Macon Hawkins, who is a person who was right. working for Shell Oil and was right. held hostage. Right. Now, it seems important to me, he's got a humanity too. The man has remained to this day, by the way, extremely sympathetic to the people of the Niger Delta. Um, it's really quite something. We did a screening for the Chevron shareholders meeting last year. Really? Macon came. And he actually spoke in Houston to an audience about his experiences in Nigeria and how urgent it is that we get real about the consequences of the way that oil is produced there. Well, I need to Isn't hear about this screening because that's sort of uh, what's interesting about the life of a documentary in mm -hmm. uh, once it's made, who it's seen by, yeah. how it's received. Uh, talk a little bit about that screening. Well, um, Chevron shareholders were invited to the screening. It was free for them. Um, some of them came. Yep. M most of them did not. We had people, many, many people in the audience who were there to protest the Chevron shareholders meeting. That's mm -hmm. the majority of who comes to the meeting. Um, it was one of those things where, I don't know if you know this, but the headquarters of Chevron is in the old Enron building in Houston, as if okay. somebody needed some more, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, a few yeah. more symbols. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not clear. What could this mean? Right. Um, it, but they have this wild glass overhang over the street, and there were 22 people from 22 countries where Chevron impacts life on the ground in ways very, very similar to what you just saw. Yes. And I looked up at the overpass, and all these people are doing a press conference in front of the building. This is right before our screening. And um, I saw all these gentlemen staring down at it, and I just, you know, I had one of those moments of how in God's name are we going to get there where we need to get yeah. until these people actually have the courage to come meet right. this woman whose kid has right. the, a kind of cancer that they're never going to come back from because of the groundwater con contamination. Right, absolutely. So let's bring this down to a personal level. Uh, I watched your film this last week. I, I was deeply impacted by it. I got up this morning and I got in my car and I drove here to interview you. And I am right now on a sound stage that probably is 80% petroleum product based. And I'm going to go through my day like any other American citizen with an awareness that my own life is intertwined and so dependent on this thing we're talking about. What is a person like me supposed to do now with what I've learned from your film? You know, as. Um as we, the, the crew on our last trip there, um, spent some time being detained by the Nigerian government mm. because they didn't appreciate the story <laughs> being yeah. told. Um, when we very luckily um, and happily, because of the actions of a lot of people in this town, mm -hmm. by the way, were released seven days later, we sat on the plane and all of us looked at each other and we, we said out loud, for the first time in our lives, we just paid the real price of oil. 
Mm -hmm. This is a price that people in the rest of the globe have understood for decades, mm -hmm. and we simply haven't. The U.S. has, uh, up until now, largely gotten away with this way of life yes. on everyone else's back. That's finally coming home to roost. Um, what you can do is this. You don't throw your hands up and say, I can't do anything, right. even though, as I pointed out earlier, you can't boycott oil. It's, it's absolutely ubiquitous. Right. What you can do, however, is understand the real issue. The real issue is don't replace it with a new addiction. Don't say, okay, I've got it. The answer is blue-green algae. The answer is wind. The answer is this. The answer is that. Because the simple truth is if the same infrastructure that got us here mm -hmm. is used in those renewable worlds, mm -hmm. it will be the same problem. You started to see that with biofuels. That if the same kind of profit and greed-centered um, structure mm -hmm. were used for, for corn and mm -hmm. biofuel, then you were going to have the same issues. So we actually can, and there are many people who mm -hmm. are working on real energy solutions. Mm -hmm. Most of them, just like food solutions, aren't that complicated. Mm -hmm. They're about being closer to the source, mm -hmm. being local, being responsible for the consequences. If Seattle had to deal with the consequences of all the gas that we use, yes. we'd change it. Right. And, and as, as sympathetic as I am to local truck drivers who are facing right now a loss of profit, mm -hmm. who just simply run a bread delivery route, I'm very sympathetic to their plight. Mm -hmm. But the truth is the gas should cost $5 a gallon in this country. Mm -hmm. It should have a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be that it costs $5 a gallon because Chevron and Shell are sitting on record profits. Right. It should cost that because that money should be taxes that are used to make real public transportation options. There, there's something that that tells me uh, the addiction you talked about is even more profound than I can conceive of because if I recall when I was a youngster sitting in line in the 70s with my dad a block l you know long at the gas pump because of the embargo of o OPEC you would have thought that would be a watershed moment where this idea you talk of of suddenly becoming clear and realizing this is not a sustainable relationship it would have changed something. But yet, I think what we're getting at is because at its core, when energy is tied to profit in this sense, it's never going to change. It doesn't, it simply doesn't work. Yeah. It, one of the things that I was um, speaking with a Chevron executive off the record, and we had this very lively and um, fabulous conversation where I said to him, the truth of the matter is I'm the capitalist in this room, not you. I believe in free markets. Free markets would have vetted you a long time ago. Uh -huh. You guys believe in rigged markets. Yeah. And they've rigged them so utterly yeah. that there's no way out unless what the way that we do it that we know today is yeah. completely broken, which can happen. It, and the only chance for that happening is just like in other places around the world, people in this country have to get it yeah. and have to demand it. And I'll tell you, in, in essence, it begins uh, maybe in a place like this where we can talk about this kind of stuff openly and ask the right kind of questions. And, uh, and you know, we're from Seattle and Washington State, yeah. and I want to say we actually have something very proud here. We have a congressman and a senator who have done some of the best stuff that has been done. If anything's mm -hmm. been done at all, they've done it. Mm -hmm. Jay Inslee and Maria Cantwell mm -hmm. are on the right side of these issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I go and talk to them, they'll say they get almost no phone call or mail on this stuff. No. I mean, how is it possible that here in the Pacific Northwest, as much as we love our environment, right. if we can just extrapolate from the film we've just watched what it means to watch your environment slowly become right. an actual cesspool, right. how can we not make this one of the most important things that we care about today? Well, it's uh, something we touched on when you and I were just chatting earlier that uh, the, if the catastrophic event that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico a year ago seems to almost have vanished from the public forum, the town square, from the debate on our future. And that in itself is a terrifying idea. Um, Sandy, what is next for you and this story, this ongoing story? You've made many trips there. Um, the end of the film clearly tells us this isn't over. There's, there, there are developments happening, uh, as you touched on, in the Middle East and North Africa that have a profound effect on Nigeria. What's, what's next for you in this story? I continue to be involved on some levels mm -hmm. in terms of showing the film. To go back to something we talked about earlier, we have shown the film to several lawmakers, mm -hmm. many senators, many congressmen, many people who are involved in international diplomacy. Mm -hmm. We've continued to pursue that. Mm -hmm. um, we sent the film to Barack Obama. 
Mm -hmm. I got to thank you for the gift. I don't know <laughs> if you watched it or not. Um, so I continue to do that. I have also been filming in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I went down there okay. last year. For me to be in a place in yes. the United States yes. that's been in many ways left for dead yeah. in the way that the Niger Delta was and to see it in my own country yeah. was incredible. And to see that, you know, what a lot of people in the U.S. don't know is that one of the largest Vietnamese communities in the U.S. Um, is in the Alabama part of the coast. Incredible fishing businesses that are family businesses that mm -hmm. had been very successful. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of relatives of, the, of those families in the Pacific Northwest. There's mm -hmm. a strong connection. Mm -hmm. So um, I did a seven minute piece that's mm -hmm. going to be on the front end of a DVD we're releasing okay. to make the connections and the issues. Um, so there are people there who are speaking about Exxon Valdez, Niger Delta, Gulf of Mexico, and there's going to be a box set with the issues of tar sands in Canada, the west coast of Ireland. Um, so it's, I mean, it's all over the world these things are connected. And we'll be, we'll be able to get information on this on the website. Yes, yeah, Sweet Crude Movie. Great. Um, and I've also been working on a film in Montana, interestingly enough, on wind energy. To, because of what we just talked about, yeah. I became this real champion of renewable energy until I realized that you have to be smarter than that. You have to be a champion of local energy. That's right. Because Chevron, BP, Shell, they've read the handwriting on the wall. They're, sur they're sure not stupid. Right, they're shifting their... And they're making they're sure they shift. That. They want to take over mm -hmm. solar, wind, etc. That kind of hegemony is something we can't afford. So I'm, I'm working on that as well. Great. Sandy, I want to thank you so much for coming in and talking with us today, uh, for inspiring us and giving us some real th the strong things to think about. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I do want to mention to our viewers that they can also catch Sweet Crude on KCTS Real Northwest series. And I wanna thank you for watching Backstory. I'm Andrew Tsao and I will see you behind the scenes soon.